Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to another TRC broadcast. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Um, God is just so good. Isn't God good? Just take a moment just to tell somebody how good God is. I'm telling you, you know, we get our deliverance from the words of our mouth. Our encouragement sometimes comes from the words of our own mouth. It's good to have other people to encourage you. But you know, like David, you got to stir yourself up. You got to encourage yourself in the Lord many times. And that just means having an awareness of just what God is in your life, just what he does in your life. Be appreciative. Have an attitude of gratitude. Well, we thank God that you are here again, once again. And um, I just want to say that uh, on Sunday, I start teaching about heart attack. I'm not going to teach that today. Uh, the, the, the second part of it is reserved for Sunday. However, God has laid some things on my heart today to just kind of minister to you. And hopefully you'll be blessed. Hopefully it will cause you to be able to reflect inwardly and see exactly where you are on the time dispensation of God. Amen. So without any further ado, let's just get right on into the word. But before we do that, I want you to like this message. I want you to subscribe. Subscribe. Hit that notification so you'll be aware when new content comes available. We just want you to be a part of us on a consistent basis so you can be fed the living word of God. Amen. So remember and share, share and share alike. Amen. Let someone else know that God is good. Be that evangelist by using the word of God, getting it into other people's hands, even if you're not the one that's preaching it. Amen. Well, let's move right along. Uh, we thank God for that. I want to talk to you uh, tonight from the subject of getting off of the merry-go-round of life. Getting off of the merry-go-round of life. We know that in certain things that even God is cyclic. We understand that there are seasons. Seasons come and seasons go, but they always come back. Well, you know, there are certain cycles in your life that you might be able to sit down and to analyze and realize that you're just stuck in a circle. Are you listening to what I'm saying? You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you were on a merry-go-round? You ever felt like that? You know, you were seeing the same thing all the time? It seems as though when you think that you're moving forward, you always end up right back at square one. Listen. And every time you feel like you've gotten some progress, you look around, you're right back there again. Are you listening? Are you anybody felt like that before? Maybe some of you are listening right now. Maybe you feel as though that you are on it. And you know, it's recognizable. It really is. But one of the greatest deceptions about it is I can't get off. There are many people right now that are on this cycle. You may you might be in a, on a merry-go-round in your marriage. Every time you think that you guys are moving forward, you have some of these first stage setbacks and you find yourself right back into that same situation. It might be with family members. You might feel as though every time that it looks like God is restoring, here comes something else. You know, these are things that are part of life. And Jesus said that you're going to have tribulations. He said there, there are going to be many afflictions. However, God is here to straighten your path. God is here to get you off of this cycle that it seems like it's so difficult to get off of. A lot of people feel like the more I accomplish, the more I'm stuck in the same place. Well, I want you to listen carefully because through the word of God today, you're going to get the keys to getting off this merry-go-round so you can finally see some real progress in your life. How many of you would like that to see real progress? Because I'm telling you, you can't be on this merry-go-round and not realize it. Let's, let's move forward. Let me give you some, some merry-go-round facts. And this is amazing because these are natural illustrations, but they bring about a serious spiritual truth. And I hope that when you listen, 
you find that, hey, is this me? Does this apply to me? Am I seeing the same thing? So here is some, um, they're well known, but they're a little realized. They're, they're, they're so uh, little realized uh, facts about the merry-go-round. For number one, what is the attraction to the merry-go-round? The attraction is the bright colors. From a, way, a long ways away, you see the glitter, you see the glare, you see the attraction. And this is what it does. It, your eyes lure you to this, this thing that you seem like you can't get away from. Along with that, you have this mystical music. You know, you hear this circus music. You hear this, this, this carousel music along with the bright lights. This is something that draws you. And then another thing is that the horses and the carts, they are all pointed forward. That gives you the illusion that when you get on this ride, you are making progress because of it being pointed forward. Are you listening? And then uh, one thing you notice that once you engage and once you get on this ride, this ride, the movement to this ride, is is so inconsistent it's always just up and down up and down up and down and you know for no longer than this ride goes around it makes you nauseous can you imagine being on this ride and can't get off for a long time you will go from nauseous to just straight out sick are you sick of this ride are you sick of this cycle are you sick of seeing the same thing because in this merry-go-round you normally fixate your eyes on something you can identify with and you see it every time you come around. It might be your parent. It might be a family member. You look for them. And as you go around and around and you look at them, you wave. They're looking at you. You see the same scenery. You see the same people. That's a good indication that you are stuck in a merry-go-round. Are you listening to what I'm saying? There are certain reasons why you could be in this predicament. There are certain reasons why you could be stuck. There are certain reasons why you fail to see progress. Let's talk about a few of those. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. And we're going to read something that Apostle Paul was, was uh, illustrating about his life at a certain point. And again, Look to see if you can identify yourself being here. Chapter 7. And I'll just read this because it's, we're going to read from 714 to 725. But I'm just going to skim over it as much as I can. But I want you to see a pattern. Are you listening? That's one thing about being in a merry-go-round of life. You will constantly see a pattern. Now, here's what Paul said. Paul said, for we know that the law is spiritual. He said, but I am cardinal. And another translation says, I am unspiritual. Uh, I think maybe uh, I was reading from the NIV, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, it gave a little more clarity to this cycle that Paul was saying. Okay, here it is. He said, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. He said, I'm sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do it. He said, but what I hate, that's what I find myself doing. Now, he's talking about sin here, but see, it could still be the same thing. You know, we have this at the beginning of the year, this phenomenon, this, this phenom called um, uh, New Year's resolution. And it could be, I want to lose weight. We always start off the year saying, I'm going to be healthy. We start off the year saying that I'm going to spend less and save more. All of these things that we say, this is things that we want to bring to pass. But yet we find ourselves no longer than a few months later, back in the same pattern of the prior year. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm going to spend more time with my family. I'm going to spend more time doing this and doing that. However, that pattern always catches up with you and you find yourself 
the next year saying the same thing, and it's over and over and over. And here Paul said, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's that principle that's living on the inside of me. It's the pattern that's on the inside of me. It is the habits and the tendencies that have taken control of my life. He goes on to say, and for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, it doesn't dwell in my sinful nature. The good doesn't. The things that I want to do, the ambitions, the aspirations, they don't dwell in my sinful nature. He said, because my sinful nature wants to be a brick, an anchor. It wants to just hold me down. It wants to keep me in a circle where I can never progress. Then he goes on to say, for I have a desire to do what is good, but it seems like I'm powerless. Are you been there? Have you been there? It seems like I don't have the resolve to bring it out. I don't have the, the power to carry it out. I have a desire, but I'm can, I can tell you this right now. And, you know, you will always learn this is that even desire cannot overcome bad habits. That principle, that pattern that's on the inside of you, desire is not enough to overcome that. Something else must be implemented in your life in order to break the pattern. Are you listening? Pattern breakers are only broken by principles. The principles of God breaks patterns. Are you listening? So with that in mind, let's just continue to go on. He said, uh, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the principle that's living in me that does it. So I find that the law at work, although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. And it doesn't, he's talking about sin. It doesn't exclude patterns. It doesn't exclude uh, 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 habits. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews, let us lay aside the sin and the weight. Some of the patterns we have might not be sin, but they are weights. These are things that keep us chained, keep us tied, keep us yoked, keep us cuffed. Are you listening? These are the things that we seem to have a hard time getting away from. He said, so he's finding out that the law is at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. He said, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. In my spiritual man, I have an excitement about doing what's right. Maybe you're there. Maybe in your inner man, you really want to do the things that's right but you find yourself being powerless that you cannot make it happen. You know that it's there. You know that it's good. You know that it's right, but you feel helpless. You feel like I just can't do it. Each time I start, each time I think that I got a running start, I always find myself right back here to the place of conformity. See, the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world. That means don't allow yourself to be hooked and shaped and molded and fashioned after this external world and its superficial customs. Don't allow it to grab you so much until you find yourself gravitating back to the thing that you so desperately want to get away from. He said, but I see another law at work, verse 23 at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Here he said, I see another law. There is something else that's making me a prisoner. It is these tendencies, these habits. It's these things that I have trained my flesh to do. And my flesh has trained me to accept. I see that law working. I understand it's there. And most people do but they don't acknowledge it because they feel powerless. They don't want to admit I don't have the power and I get that. However, they still are, are, are locked in to this place, seeing that other law 
taking advantage of them. That other law, the law of the fallen nature, taking advantage, causing you to always be stuck. And there is a parameter around you and you never can seem to break it for long. And if you do, you only visit outside of it. But you always gravitate back to the place of conformity. He said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to this pattern, subject to this death? Who will rescue me from this? He asked a question. I want you to look. He said, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. He's saying there is an internal battle going on. There is a, a conflict going on on the inside of me, even as it is in most people. We saw when Esau and Jacob was born, the Bible said that they were twins, but that that was representative of those two natures that we have to fight. There is one nature want to do right. There is the nature of the flesh that always wants to keep you bound, keep you weighted down, keep you in a cycle, keep you on the proverbial merry-go-round. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So now let's continue. Uh, let's continue to move on here. Uh, the first thing that keeps us on this merry-go-round is the battle, battle of our inner nature, the conflict we have with the flesh. See, you don't, if you are born again of Jesus Christ, you no longer have a flesh nature, but you have to deal with a, you know, you don't have a sin nature, but you have to deal with a sin conscience. See, that's the part that wasn't immediately changed. The mindset. That's why the Bible tells us about renewing our mind to the word of God. Remember me saying that only the principles of God can destroy the patterns of the flesh. So here what we're looking at is God is telling us. He's saying that when you feel stuck. And there are people listening to me. There are people who have been saved. They got saved with Abraham. And they are still dealing with these merry-go-round effects in their lives. They don't understand, they don't realize to a certain degree, why am I still bound to all of this stuff as long as I've been saved? And there is a reason for that. Are you listening? Uh, Paul was describing his, his experience as an immature believer. He was describing his the onset of salvation. He was describing himself, as many people are right now, as a baby Christian. You know, he said, I would love to give you milk, I mean meat, but you cannot, you, you, you can't handle that right now. He says, so I gave you milk. You know, and the Bible says, oh, man, Peter, second chapter, it says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. As a baby Christian, you still are prone to doing things that you know on the inside your spirit man convicts you of. It tells you that it's wrong. But see, when you're a baby Christian, like many people, you know it's wrong. You understand the principle. You understand the concept. You understand the pattern. But what identifies you as a baby Christian, you don't seem to have the power to break it. Are, are you listening? You don't seem to have the power to break it. So most people just go on as though they don't realize what's happening. They are in denial that certain things are not like they ought to be in their lives. Certain things are wrong. The way you handle certain things are wrong. We like to sweep it under the rug. We like to blame other folks. We like to do this. We like to ignore it. But the truth of the matter is it identifies you as a baby Christian because inevitably what you have done was acknowledge the fact I don't have the power to do it. I can't break it. I can't get off. And when you look at this merry-go-round, it appears to be going so fast, you think that if you get off, it's going to hurt you. But not so. So Romans uh, 4.23 says, 
to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, to be renewed. It is the mind that has to be redeveloped. It is your thought process. The Lord says in Isaiah, he said, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. So in order for us to walk together, according to Amos 3, 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You must adopt my mindset. You must adopt the mind of Christ. You must adopt my ways. And when you do adopt my ways, we can flow together. We can walk together. But until you do, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be a discrepancy. There's going to be issues. And, and, and guys, I have to say this again. For many people, you've been saved a long time. But listen, you cannot have the Holy Ghost and not really know that certain things are not like they ought to be. Are you listening? But we don't want to confront them. We don't want to just stop the press and deal with these areas. So we compromise and we keep going forward like the merry-go-round. Everything is pointed forward, but you're still going in a circle. That is an illusion. You are not really progressing. We are not progressing when we are on, and you might choose, I want this nice white horse. I want a black horse. I just want to sit in the chair. Well, regardless to how you ride it, it's going in a circle. Look at somebody and say, it's going in a circle. I know Billy Preston made that song. Will it go around in circles? Yeah, yeah, it will. It'll go around in circles. And if you don't change it, well, Billy might be a prophet today. He said nothing from nothing. That's right. Put it down in the comment. Leaves nothing. We have to get to a place where we can tangibly see the work of God in our lives and see the progress according to the scriptures and not according to what we tolerate. Are you listening? So let's talk about quickly the power to get off. So you got a situation that's been going on for a while. And again, I said, you feel powerless to change it. What you need is some real power. You don't need willpower. You need real power. Are you listening? See, willpower is not enough. A lot of times we think that we can overcome certain things by having willpower. Willpower is not really the answer. Willpower is not really the problem. You know why? Because many things that we are uh, uh, encounter in our lives, we will to stay there and not even the word of God can move us. So it's not the willpower. It is first making a decision to use your will in another area. You follow what I'm saying? Now that might sound a little tough, but that's real. You need real power. What is real power? Let's go to Luke chapter four. We're going to talk about real power. Jesus understood about real power. There were things Jesus knew he had to accomplish in his life, just like you and I, but he understood also that it's going to take real power in order to do it. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4 and 18, listen to what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, or, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, listen. Here is a laundry list of things Jesus knew he had to accomplish. And the only way he could accomplish it, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to accomplish this. It is the anointing that gives you the power to accomplish it. Now, most people, when they hear that, and we saw Jesus do it all. We saw him set people free. We saw him open blind eyes. We saw him set at liberty, them that are bruised. We saw him deliver the captives. We saw Jesus do all of that. And so most people in their excuse or reasoning will say, yes, but that was Jesus. Well, I'm glad you said that. Let's just move right quickly over to Acts, the first chapter. 
Now, that was Jesus, but here's the promise Jesus made, not only to the people who followed him, but he made it to us. If we follow him, are you listening? Now, listen to what he says in Acts, the first chapter. He told the disciples to go and to wait for him until they are endued with real power. Are, are you listening? Real power. Listen to what he said. But you shall receive that same power that was on me to do all of these things. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses of me uh, in both Jerusalem, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken away and the cloud received them out of their sight. Now, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said that if you go, you wait for me, you are going to receive power to become witnesses. Now, let me tell you something, guys. Most people in the body of Christ, and especially during this time of apostasy, are not really walking in that power to be a witness. What is a witness? First of all, let's look at this. Let's look at the definition of what a witness is. And let's see if this is something that we are, are part of. Now, it says that a witness, they have knowledge of an event or change from personal observation or personal experience. What most people in the church do right now, they believe that they're walking in this power, not from personal observation, not from personal experience, but from hearsay. Hearsay is not admissible, even in court. Hearsay. When you say, the preacher said, when you said, I heard uh, Bishop Jake say, I heard Michael Todd say, I heard Bishop McLeod say, I heard your favorite preacher, insert them right here. That's hearsay. That is not a personal experience. That is not something that you, a personal observation. This is not something you can say in my life. I walked through this and I saw it happen. All I know is I went to church on Sunday and this is what they said the word of God did for them. That's hearsay. And that's not admissible. That's not substantial. That's not enough. Are you listening? That's not validated. Hearsay is not. Are you listening? Now, how do we get free? See, you got to have that Holy Ghost power. It is that anointing that gets you free. Now, let me go ahead and move on really quickly. How do we get free? This is what I want to know. Well, Galatians, the fifth chapter. In verse 1, it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or the freedom wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now, you got to understand something. When he said, go and wait in Jerusalem until you are due with power from on high, he said in St. John, if I don't leave, the Holy Ghost won't come. Now, stand fast in the liberty. Let's put it together. Where Christ has given us the power to be free, stand fast, stand firm, start, stand steadfast in the freedom, and be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. Now, see, the yoke is what they use to keep oxen in control, to keep them from having a free course keeping them from going where they wanted to go so they would always be under control. The oxen were under a yoke. And this is what happens when you're on the merry-go-round. You are under a yoke. Are you listening to what I'm saying? See, this is how we got there. When Adam and Eve sinned and passed on their Adamic nature, this is where the problem came. They became self-centered. When you are self-centered, when you become the focal point of your own life, you are like the proverbial stake that's in the ground. You tie the dog to it. And although he feel like he's free, he is only 
he only has the liberty to run in a circle. Why? Because of the anchor in the center. When you become the focal point. Now, what do I mean by that? When it's your will and not his will. When you, everything evolves around you. When you have to be satisfied before you satisfy God. You become the proverbial uh, center of your life. There's a song I remember years ago, a uh, young man used to sing, and it said, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Jesus, you are the center. All things evolve around you. See, Jesus, the Bible says, in him we live, we move, we have our being. You even move in Jesus. But when you become the center, when you become the focal point, then you become the center of your life and nothing else can you can evolve outside of that parameter that you are capable of producing. Your finances can never go that far. Your joy can never go that far. Your friends can never go that far. Your whole life seems to be in a circle. And I guarantee you, you know when it's like that because everybody you see are the same people. Everything you experience is the same experience. You go from one place to another producing the same thing. That's because you have created these self-imposed restrictions because you made you the center of your own life. See, if you move in God, God will take you from one place to another. When you move in you, you are you got the illusion that you are progressing only to find out you are only running in a circle. Did you, man, I, I hope you get this. I really, really hope you get this. Again, examine yourself. Look at your life. Are you saying and doing the same things you did last year? Have you been set back by that mentality that you won't allow Jesus to change? Do you think the same way that you've always thought so that everyone else is always wrong and you are always right? Are you still insecure? Do you still hide behind insecurity? Do you still, are you a recluse? Are you, are you an introvert? Not by nature, but an introvert by decision, by, by, by habit. Or do you shy away from confrontation with the word of God when you know that certain things need to be fixed? Do you confront people more than you confront you? See, that's a good way. Sometimes you have to be on the other end of that confrontation and not just everybody else. It's easy to find something wrong with everyone else, but can we find something wrong with ourselves? If you can't, I can tell you now, you are in a circle. You are in on that merry-go-round and you are seeing the same patterns produced that can only be broken by the principles of God. Now, let's close this. So you are yoked to these self-imposed restrictions. You are yoked to it because you think the same way. You won't allow God to change. We know that God is saying there's more. There is more. I have more for you. But we don't allow ourselves to experience that change because we are yoked and tied and cuffed to our own mentality our own habits, our own tendencies, our own way. And the only thing can break that is real power. Let's close by looking at Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. Listen to this. And it shall come to pass that in that day, when is that day? The day you surrender. The day you say, Lord, it's me, oh me, Lord, Standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my mother, but it's me. You remember John P. Key saying that? But it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That his burden 
that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder. Remember that? And the yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. See, we exchange the anointing for self-gratification. We substitute the anointing for a feel good. We, we Listen, you can feel as good as you want, but if there is no freedom, if, if you have not been freed by the anointing of God, it's not the anointing of God. Does your decisions carry you deeper and deeper into bondage? Are you listening? The anointing causes a breakthrough. It will remove the burden off of your shoulders. You're carrying things needlessly and it will destroy the yoke. Do you feel like that? Do you go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning with a burden, not anticipating what could happen good during the day, but you're saying, here I am again, same old thing, same old, same old. You need the anointing. And how do you get the anointing? You get the anointing when you surrender to the will of God, when you surrender to the power of God. So first of all, he can free you. You're not free then to do what you want to do. You're free to do what you need to do, what you ought to do. Are you listening? Nothing short of the north that can free you and give you power to get off of that merry-go-round. And St. Saint, Saint John chapter 8 and verse 36 says, And whom the Son has made free is free indeed. You are not really free until the anointing makes you free. You're not free because you feel free. You're not free because you think you're free. You are not free until the anointing frees you and you are able to look at your life and see real progress, not just still see the same thing over and over and over. Are you seeing the same thing? Do you experience the same thing? Are you creating the same habits in different places? If so, you're on a merry-go-round and nothing short of the anointing can free you. Well, as the scripture says, we have dwelt on this mountain long enough. It's time to stop going in a circle. He said, and I'll make the crooked places straight so you can move forward and be able to do your assignment, do his will, please him so he can say, well done. Well, I hope you got blessed by the word of God. I hope this meant a lot to you. I'm here to tell you right now, I want you to share this message. Share it. Share the message. I want you to uh, uh, subscribe. I want you to like this message. Praise God. It will do your world of good to surrender to the word of God and let God free you. Your marriage shouldn't still be like that. Your life shouldn't still be like that. Your pattern should be, shouldn't still be like that. Only the principles of God can break those patterns. Are you listening? So I thank God for his word tonight. Remember, we are on this debt-free challenge, and I still believe God is going to do tremendous things by years in. He is already doing some great things. So if you want to get a part of it, you want to connect with us, then look on our giving app. Say, hey, I want to help y'all pay this thing off. I want y'all to help pay this building off. Praise God. So just, just be a part of it. Amen. If the Lord directs you, be oh, obey him. If he doesn't, it's still all right. We still love you. Amen. Praise God. So whatever you do, whenever you do it, and however you do it, what I want you to do is allow yourself to be free of this merry-go-round. That's the only way you know you can. Keep it real.